thinking of it as legal tech might be unhelpful in terms of really deciding where you're where you're best to focus your efforts um so really think about the sector that you're interested in like you know are you interested in in family law because or versus financial services because the types of tech solutions legal tech solutions are so different Hello everyone and welcome to the Student Lawyer podcast series. Whether you're at school, sixth form, university, thinking about a career in law or exploring law careers, you're in the right place. We are the one-stop shop for student lawyers. If you'd like to join the Student Lawyer as a writer, please email hello at thestudentlawyer.com. This podcast is brought to you by Feed Ignite. Welcome to the Student Lawyer Podcast Series. My name's Camilla and I'm a future trainee solicitor and current LPC student. Today on the episode, I'm joined by Kalila Bolton, Legal and Ops Lead at Lawyer, which is a legal tech company. I'm really excited to have Kalila as a guest on the show because um, she's going to talk to us all about how she actually went about pursuing a career in legal tech. Legal tech is one of those areas that um, we know is growing because of the increasing uh, relationship between law and technology, but there doesn't really seem to be a clear path for students and aspiring solicitors who are keen to pursue a career in legal tech. So I'm very excited to get Kalila's take on that. So without further ado, let's welcome Kalila onto the show. Welcome to the Student Lawyer Podcast, Kalila. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Thank you for being a guest. Um, just before we get started, I've got a few questions for you today, so um, we'll jump right into it. But before we do that, would you mind giving the listeners an overview of your career to date? Sure, no problem. So my career has been um, always a bit of a question mark for me about what I was going to be doing. Um, I remember when I was choosing my A-levels, I ended up choosing computing history maths and French and all these things and my teacher at the time saying this is a little bit of a confused selection (laughs) um I I went with it um and then ended up having to kind of force myself into a degree topic and I thought okay history is still very open I still have lots of choice I don't know what I'm going to do with my career so at least I've kind of kept the door ajar for lots of different things hopefully um got to uni got to second year of my history degree and thought oh yeah, I still don't know what I want to do. (laughs) Um, And ended up going to lots of careers fairs, um, just kind of reading all about everything in the graduate recruitment books and um, went to a few law presentations and decided that um, I'd go for kind of commercial law route and then went to an A&O one, thought that the culture fit was really good for me um, and applied um, for their vacation scheme um, in my second year. Did my vacation scheme, really loved it, loved the people and I was very fortunate to get a training contract offer. So started the training contract in 2017 but obviously had to do the GDL and the LPC um, which yeah. is which is fine you get through them <laughs> um, and then so yeah started in 2017 at A&O did my training contract um, I did a very broad training contract which I actually really recommend for anyone that's kind of not quite sure where they want to end up qualification wise um, so I did a finance seat in the capital markets team I did um, commercial contracts which all the data protection and IP stuff I did my employment seat and then I ended up going to DeepMind on a secondment. So in the Google building, which was everything I hoped it would be in terms of fun activities in the office. Wow, Um, I can imagine. Which was really cool. Um, And the team there are amazing and some really interesting work. So I think the tech bug really started probably on my secondment for sure. Um, And then I qualified into the A&O employment team, um, which was great. Um, love the team there did some really interesting litigation and some really interesting um, advice pieces Um, but then six months in pandemic hit um, all the fun kind of um, stops a little bit in terms of not being able to see your colleagues all the time and I think it was a real time for me to kind of reflect on um, where I was in my career and and what was really important to me Um, I did a lot of pro bono with A&O and I and I I really had this kind of tech bug from DeepMind and I thought you know I think it's a really good time for me to just 
just double check to see what's out there yeah. um, in terms of kind of tech and, and things that really make me tick. And I wasn't particularly looking for a, a, a new role, but I saw a lawyer and I just thought this is like totally 100% um, me in terms of um, where I think I can add some value, have some kind of legal knowledge and some tech knowledge. And maybe this is a great combination of both. Um, so then applied for the legal and ops role. And this is where I am now as um, a legal and ops lead for lawyer. Such an interesting career history. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I love it. I mean, the fact that you did computing at A level um, that really kind of resonates with me because I, well, I did something very similar, which I'll talk mm. a little bit about later on. But um, yeah, no, it's 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 great to sort of see that you've tried lots of di- uh, different things and now and it's all shaped your path to to where you are at now. Um, so, could you explain just for people who maybe a little bit like me, who aren't quite sure what legal tech is. Um, what is legal tech and, and how can it be used? It's a great question. <laughs> um, I think legal tech is sometimes an unhelpful umbrella term for something that's very um, very diverse in terms of the types of careers you can get involved with and also the types of industries. Um, so there's, there's definitely, it's probably helpful for me to describe it in two very broad buckets so the first one being kind of supporting lawyers as your kind of end user and client um so delivering better products better services making their services more efficient maybe in-house or or to their kind of um private clients or businesses but then there's also the kind of consumer facing legal tech which is um, perhaps becoming a lot more popular now which is helping consumers access justice or legal help without necessarily using lawyers or if they do with a reduced lawyer input, so making it more affordable. So there's two big buckets, um, but the amount of industries that could kind of touch on legal tech is enormous. It could be um, related to the financial sector, um, could be more in the consumer space, in the kind of transactional and corporate space. Um, so it's, it's a very, it's probably an unhelpful term, which I think is what makes it um, so mysterious. <laughs> um, but yeah. It's definitely evolving quite quickly. Well, that's interesting. Um, so where does lawyer fit in under those different sort of umbrellas? Um, what does lawyer do and, and how does uh, that organisation use technology? Sure. So I think lawyer definitely fits into the kind of second category I mentioned in terms of really thinking about how we can help just like normal members of the public access legal expertise and, and, and access justice without having to pick up the phone to a lawyer. I think the law world is seen as very inaccessible, quite alien and, and quite intimidating to people. And I think fundamentally just seen as very unaffordable. Yeah. But we always have legal questions like, oh, my, my landlord, um, you know, doesn't seem to be um, honouring this obligation or I'm really struggling to get a refund on this and I'm, I'm potentially going to lose lots of money. We, we always kind of come into contact with legal issues but we don't think we can contact a lawyer because it's just another planet (laughs) Um, and I think lawyer tries to really bridge that gap so allowing people to access services kind of legal um, guidance and services very um, often free and otherwise very affordably kind of at the touch of a button really so we, we like to give people a very straightforward interface very broken down guidance and we also like to give people some guidance that's very tailored to them as well um so whilst some free legal advice sites are super helpful um often they're kind of for every situation and you have to unpick which bits are relevant to you yeah um, but at the we like to really kind of make it bespoke and tailored to people so that they can get their answer really quickly and and move on from their issue which i think everyone would like to do <laughs> Definitely. Oh, that sounds like a really good use of um, technology to help accessibility. So your role at Lawyer, uh, that that also sounds really interesting. Would you mind telling us more about what actually a legal and ops lead is and and what you do? It's another very good question because I think (laughs) legal and ops leads is such a broad term as well. Yeah. And I think my day to day, I probably couldn't possibly um, hone it in on kind of one single thing that I do, but it's um, very much not just an employment lawyer anymore, um, kind of a bit of a jack of all trades job. So um, mainly producing um, content at the moment. Um, so we produce flows, which are basically a 
a tailored series of questions that give you some more um, specific guidance to your issue and, and give you some kind of potential actions. So I produce those. So the legal knowledge is really helpful, but I've also got to think about how can I structure this in a way that's really helpful for people and also thinking about um, some of the coding elements. I'm definitely not a technical person, but um, Charlie, our founder, is definitely trying to teach me and train me up on Python. So that's very that's amazing. Useful. Um, which is really good um doing some blog posts and social media content um but also most recently we're really working hard on a, a tool called Rentsitch, um which is a way of helping tenants to get kind of compensation if their deposit hasn't been protected properly or if they're living in um, a hmo which is a house of multiple occupancy so if you're living in a, a, a house with, with people that aren't in your household you might be able to get um, a rent repayment if if your HMO hasn't been licensed so we're really focusing on trying to help people kind of get what they deserve because lots of these things are just so difficult to work out without legal help so we're really kind of working in that space at the moment so l- working on lots of the legal content around there and, and also just trying to think about and strategize what what really is important for people going forwards as well so there definitely isn't a day-to-day for me at all it's um very different <laughs> that sounds so good and and it sounds like you get to use your creativity skills as well alongside your legal skills which which must must be really enjoyable I, I suppose Definitely. Um, and I think I, I really enjoy working with um, some, we, we have legal contributors that help us who are mostly law students um, and some kind of trainee lawyers and, and people barristers. And it's really great to work with them because they have lots of really wonderful ideas about content that we can put on our site and kind of how we can really best interact with people and support people. So yeah, really, really enjoy that side of the job for sure. Fantastic. Uh, so I think we've touched on this a little bit, but um, I just kind of wanted to dive into what drew you to working in legal tech in the first place and, and what the main difference is between working in a legal tech company and working at a traditional law firm like a and has been. I think a and was a really great place for me to learn that I wanted to pursue legal tech um, because a and is probably quite unique in that it's really put tech top of the agenda for a long time. Um, I don't know if you've heard of Fuse, but it's kind of their innovation space. And I I kind of always had a lot of interest in that area and seeing some of the startups popping up on the first floor, everyone looking very trendy in comparison to us. Um, And and always kind of having half an eye on the kind of things they were getting up to. And I think um, also paired with that, A and I did a lot of pro bono work, um, which when the pandemic hit, increasingly went to remote advice and really having to make use of tech solutions in the legal advice clinics. Um, so I think those experiences really kind of molded my interest in in the capability of legal tech. Um, and so I think that's something that really drew me um, to pursuing a bit more of a career in it. Um, I think the main differences are probably the fact that it's so multidisciplinary in terms of um, I need to work with technical people every day. Um, you know, I, I, you need to work with so many different types of people. It's it's not just kind of um, lawyers are my only colleagues. Now it's very much I'm actually the only lawyer in the business at the moment and, and working with law students and, and lots of um, technical people is, is really interesting. So it, that's a big difference. The type of end user is obviously incredibly different. Um, at a and my clients to kind of typically, you know, large corporate businesses or, or well, mainly business clients. Um, obviously, now we're aiming at to kind of support and serve members of the general public. So it could be literally anyone. And we need to make sure that the advice is really tailored to non-lawyers as much as possible. Um, so re- really different. So type of clients and the type of people you work with, I, I guess, are like the main differences for me. And legal tech um, careers advice, um, mm. just generally for the listeners who might be interested in a career in legal tech. To me, I mean, I've had a little look around um, out of my own curiosity, and it doesn't really seem to be that easily accessible. There's, there doesn't really seem to be that much of a clearly defined path to getting into legal tech um, for uh, students at the moment. Um mm. I think actually some firms are doing things like uh, I know Clifford Chance is doing the the uh, Ignite training contract and things like that. But I, I think I, I think that's sort of the exception rather than the rule from what I've seen. Yeah. <laughs> um, what advice would you give to listeners who are interested in a career in legal tech but aren't quite sure where to start? 
I think I would probably, and kind of as we mentioned earlier in the interview, just talking about the real different sectors within legal tech and try and unpick it that way, because I think thinking of it as legal tech um, might be unhelpful in terms of really deciding where you're where you're best to focus your efforts. Um, so really think about the sector that you're interested in. Like, you know, are you interested in in family law because or versus financial services because the types of tech solutions, legal tech solutions, are so different and it takes very different skills and um, and interests that it's probably best to think of it slightly more broken down in terms of sector and drivers. Um, also, I probably not think of it as solely a, a legal job. Um, you know, if, if you haven't yet started um, your GDL or LPC and you're a non-law student, being a lawyer first is not necessarily the only option. You might decide that you have um, real skills in project management or operations or even things like data science or software development. Um, these are all things that um, are other entry points into legal tech. So there's so many different angles, which is probably why there isn't one good source of um, um, knowledge of how to get into it. But I just encourage you to kind of um, really break it down and think about what I'm interested in and, and what you want to get out of it. Um, if you are in a training contract at the moment or about to start one, um, as you mentioned, there's lots of firms that have these um, incubator and accelerated programs and I think they're only going to become more, more common um, even if there's not kind of a set secondment or set training contract in those programs to speak to the people involved and, and go to any events so I'd, I'd really encourage you to just kind of get involved as much as possible and carve your own route um, into legal tech which sounds a bit daunting but um, it's definitely I think the way um, that I found kind of I got most out of it in terms of something that's really relevant to me. That's really helpful. Thank you for sharing that. No problem. <laughs> so do you think there are any particular skills that you need to be successful in legal tech besides the norm, the usual skills that law firm employers look for? Um, and if so, how do you think listeners can go about developing those? Sure. Um, I think one of the things that's really useful is being able to work across disciplines and being able to explain legal concepts to the people you're working with, like technical experts um, and any other people that are helping to um, promote material or anything like that. You, you really need to understand how legal advice and, and legal guidance is received by other people um, and be able to break it down really simply. Um, and I think one of the things I think is a really common misconception about moving into legal tech is that you have to be really interested in law. Um, which sounds a bit daft, but actually I think a few people think that if you're in private practice and go to legal tech, it's less legal. Um, but actually it's just really looking at the law in a different way. Um, so I'm often thinking about, okay, how can we automate this legal process, which involves really understanding the nuts and bolts of, of how the law works and the different variations and possibilities. So an interest in law is, is really important and not necessarily, you know, going through the case law, but I think that's something that's maybe often missed. Um, and I think being a bit entrepreneurial, um, not being afraid to kind of offer scalable ideas that are a bit different to, um, hit, you know, traditional solutions. Um, and also, I think in legal tech more than anything else, particularly in the kind of more consumer facing legal tech companies, really being able to relate to different types of people and their experience and, and making sure everything you're saying is, um, you know, really accessible um, and really easily understood as well. So lots of different skills that are quite different from maybe your more kind of corporate or commercial firms. And, and what's it like being a woman in tech? Because, I mean, from my experience, well, I know that um, law and tech are both traditionally very underrepresented. Um, but yeah, definitely. Sort of looping back to what I said at the beginning, I, I don't know what it was like on your computing A-level course, but I did a BTEC in software development it, back in, like, 2005. And mm. um, I think I was the only – I was one of two – uh, women on the course and um, it was like about 30 men <laughs> so it was very <laughs> underrepresented um <laughs> hopefully it's got a little bit better than that now but yeah I just wondered what your experience has been like um yeah being a woman in tech yeah definitely and I think it's something that um I was definitely kind of had in the back of my mind when I was looking into um 
a legal tech career because I think that the the stereotypes and, and what you hear definitely is is slightly um, makes you feel a bit anxious about whether you're going to be able to thrive in that environment. But a hundred percent, like had had a positive experience. Um, obviously, I'm in a very small um, startup, and I've been very well supported by our founder, who's um, busted all of the jargon in terms of coding and all of this. And um, I think the nice thing about legal tech is you really feel like you've got a place at the table because you've got your legal experience and and you can offer something else that maybe a technical person doesn't have that background. Um, So it's nice to be able to kind of really collaborate in your experience. But generally speaking, um, just looking around me in terms of the legal tech space, there's so many impressive women that are doing incredible things, Um, you know, starting legal tech companies, um, you know, um, Shruti um, in the A&A few space, obviously, um, doing an incredible job um, so there's lots of wonderful role models and I think I've seen um, you know lots of women entering the legal tech space in in various capacities so I think my experience has been really positive um, and I'd like to think it will become kind of even more um, even more women will, will start joining us as well. <laughs> yes I hope so that would be absolutely amazing um, and it's really great that you can be a role model um, to you know show visibility that you know women are working in legal tech and um to provide a, yeah a role model really mm, i'd hope so. so if you could go back in time and give yourself one piece of advice when you were at law school um or uh university what would that be um i think it, if, if i had my legal hat on i'd probably yeah. say don't listen to people that say once you've chosen your department or specialism you can never change it and you can never change your career once you start with law I think there's a bit of a and may, may, maybe this is not the case anymore but I think definitely when I started my training it there was a real pressure of wherever you qualify that was it you know you're you're this lawyer for life or you're in this department and that's it and you and once you're in the le- the law career you can't get out of it or you have to be in private practice for x amount of years um so I think I think it's just you know make your own rules like no one's these rules are, are artificial they're they're just kind of invented a little bit and um I think knowing that it, the, that your career is a bit more flexible than people make out I think is is quite liberating and, and allows you to really think about what really drives you um I think the other piece of advice I'd have is um really think about what makes you tick rather than what you think looks best or is most prestigious or whatever else because ultimately you know the legal industry um it, it's a hard it's a hard career you do have to work hard in many of the the jobs in in law and if you can enjoy it and thrive in it then that's what's going to be kind of the most rewarding experience um so I guess I'd give myself a a bit of a break if I could give myself some advice you know don't put too much pressure on on your choices and um uh, what you think looks good just really focus on kind of what makes you tick in that in that moment I would say that's brilliant advice thank you so much for sharing that um that's yeah that really helpful also for me who who um is just embarking on my legal career as well that's good to know that you can just kind of forge your own path and you don't need to listen to people who say that you yeah stuck doing one thing (laughs) that's great you'll you'll definitely hear that quite a bit um yeah definitely not the case (laughs) hopefully i'm proof of that (laughs) yeah definitely you are are. (laughs) so we've reached the end of the episode which is such a shame because it's been amazing to have you on the show you provided so much insight into what it's like to work in legal tech and how to actually break into the legal tech industry which I know is such a misunderstood area so thank you so much for shining a light on that I'm sure that the listeners will really find that valuable. So so thank you again. And thank you to the listeners for tuning in. Um, I will leave the uh, a link to Loya. And also, if Kalila doesn't mind, I will leave a link to her LinkedIn in the description box as well. Yeah, absolutely. That's no problem at all. And, yeah. it, and if um, it, just in terms of um, Loya, if anyone's interested in getting involved with Loya and, or contributing any content, then you can, um, I'll give you the sign up link um, after and you can check it out after this podcast um, or otherwise email me at hiring at lawyer.com and you can get involved. Fantastic. I will leave those details in the description box of the podcast um, for all of the listeners. So yeah, thank you so much for being on the show. Um, no and yeah, I'll speak to you again soon. <laughs> bye. Thank you. hear more of the student lawyers podcast 
hit the subscribe button and leave us a star rating and review. If you would like to join The Student Lawyer as a writer, please email hello at thestudentlawyer.com. We'd like to thank Felix Knight for producing this podcast today.